It's a beautiful day to become a citizen. Holland, Michigan, like many other smaller communities across the country, is trying to deal with problems associated with the arrival in recent years of large numbers of immigrants from non-Anglo-Saxon cultures. As mayor of the city of Holland, it gives me great pleasure to rise and offer a few heartfelt words at the ceremony of friendship and international understanding. At the national level, the federal government has been unable or unwilling to give priority to widespread local problems caused by both legal and illegal immigration. In 1986, Congress passed and President Reagan signed the Immigration Reform and Control Act. But before it became law, business interests succeeded in watering down federal controls on employment of illegal immigrants. The Immigration Reform and Control Act, known as IRCA, was passed in 1986. It came from the recommendations of the U.S. Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy and was steered, shepherded through the Congress in the Senate by Senator Alan Simpson and Senator Ted Kennedy and in the House of Representatives by Peter Rodino from New Jersey and Hamilton Fish from New York, all four of whom were on the Select Commission. And it had a principal objective. Uh, the principal objective was to curtail illegal immigration and to get rid of a system of indentured labor, uh, which was the last uh, remaining vestige of indenture and slavery in the United States. That is to say, the toleration of large numbers of workers in the United States who had no legal status and who uh, had no way of protecting themselves against uh, exploitative uh, employers. Uh, and so that was our intention. It did not uh, succeed totally, but it set forth the principles and laid down the mechanisms by which we could control illegal immigration better, more effectively, without expecting perfection, and uh, by which we could get rid of, thereby get rid of, this system of indenture. And a principal way of getting rid of it was to legalize approximately three million aliens who had been here for a long time continuously. So we did the 86 bill. 2.9 million people came forward, an extraordinary act of generosity. And yet the groups were still saying that we're not a generous enough country, we must bring in more, we must bring in more. Well, anyway, the 2.9 came forward, and they weren't from Mexico. They were from all over the world. They were from Canada, England, Austria, you name it. And they've been waiting in the United States just for such an act of grace. So they came forward, and then we began to turn our attention to legal immigration. Well, then by that time, in, in, after the 86 Act, and then there was the great rush of the Statue of Liberty and America the Beautiful, and, and I always said, well, the, you know, but the Statue of Liberty, the marvelous uh, poem by Emma Lazarus, doesn't say send us everybody you've got legally or illegally. In 1994, civil rights icon Barbara Jordan was appointed chair of a presidential commission on immigration reform that would suggest possible revisions in the unsuccessful 1986 law. In the 90s, we did the bill. It was probably too generous. Uh, uh, the lottery, and uh, then uh, I knew from then on it was going to go straight up. So then the Barbara Jordan report, the Barbara Jordan is a magnificent woman uh, with her commission, and she gave us some wonderful recommendations after 90, and she died. And when she died, everything I tried to do died with her. And uh, she was a wonderful ally, and she was talking about a breathing space, maybe 550, 600,000 a year, and then look at it for five years. Where are we going? Where are we going demographically? Where are we going as Americanization? That was a word she used. Hell, if I'd have used it, they'd have pulled the temple down, Samson without hair. But she did, and she talked of that, and, uh, and she was honest, uh, true as a die to herself, uh, and uh, we couldn't get that done. And, uh, and, uh, the things that she was saying were very important, uh, but uh, 
and the commission work is superb, but uh, it went a glimmering. And uh, I tried it in the Senate and got it rammed in my ear in royal fashion. We have got to have explicitly what we in the commission, U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform, called an Americanization policy and be proud of it and not uh, flee from it. Uh, and there are th different components to it. Uh, one is to have a set of uh, adjustment opportunities provided for by state and local governments, by churches and other private organizations, and to inc and they do a lot of this already. But there are th we encourage, we gave specific practices that would help uh, private and non and and nonprofit and public organizations do those things to help people become Americans, to help them become more comfortable. And especially, of course, we're concerned about children. And that's where the real test is. The second thing is, obviously, you've got to have a common language. You have a national civic culture. It's based on an ideal and not on a tribal blood myth. Uh, so you've got to have a way of communicating. We want to keep up an emphasis on civic education in the schools so that children, youngsters, will really come to understand what this marvelous thing, this really nearly sacred document, the Constitution of the United States is, why it's uh, its embrace of freedom of speech, of assembly, of religion, the other Bill of Rights, and the 14th Amendment especially, why they are so important in making a free society. The romantic version of our immigration history often influences legislation on the subject. It prompted future President John Kennedy to call on Professor Fuchs for help promoting immigration reform. When John Kennedy was a United States Senator, he wrote a book called A Nation of Immigrants. John Kennedy, like so many of us, and I put Ronald Reagan in this same category, were romantic immigrationists. That is to say, they saw in immigration a reaffirmation of the American myth and its narrative and tended to overlook any problems connected to immigration. And they tended to see uh, immigration as without much cost. And it's not an unlimited costless phenomenon. John Kennedy wrote this book, very favorable to immigration, and attacked the national origins quota system which was the method of selecting immigrants, a restricted number of immigrants that was used in the 1924 legislation. Now, he wasn't the first president to make that attack. Truman had attacked the National Origins Quota System. Eisenhower attacked the National Origins Quota System, spoke about it in an inaugural address, sent up legislation, but nothing happened, and nothing happened with John Kennedy's administration either. The votes simply weren't there. But he died. He was killed. He became a martyred hero. The things that he valued and stood for took on elevated significance. He was succeeded by a skillful man who had been vice president and senate majority leader who knew every trick in the book to get difficult, controversial legislation passed in the Congress. Johnson took it on, spoke about it eloquently, and, of course, we got the 1965 uh, Immigration Act. Teddy Kennedy played a major role as a young, brand new senator in the United States Senate in helping to manage that legislation on the floor. And Johnson did everything he could do to get it passed, and he succeeded. He sent the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, up to the Hill to explain why this would be a triumph for the United States over the terrible, awful, which it was, Soviet Union and its closed system. We didn't want to let anybody out. and didn't, Nobody would want to come in there. And here the whole world would want to come in here and we're perfectly open and free to anybody can leave whenever they like. What a marvelous propaganda weapon in the Cold War. Since Barbara Jordan's death in 1996, there has been much debate about the nature of immigration reform but little movement toward enacting a new law. The problem with immigration in the United States is that we have a set of policies that we've had and been developing for some time, say about 40 years at least, 
that have largely created a, a system which is widely dysfunctional. And, and that dysfunction is agreed on the left and the right. The second problem we have, which is more of a broader problem with our politics, is a, a, an inability in many ways to solve, which is becoming a larger and larger and larger problem. Uh, that fact really hasn't changed. We went through a very large debate, actually two debates, over attempts to solve it from a comprehensive matter, both of which failed. Any new administration comes in with that same set of dilemmas. Congress has changed a little bit, but the issue, the particulars, uh, the problem has not changed hardly at all. Uh, if anything, it's gotten worse. Uh, the, the key thing to understand about immigration policy over the last, say, 40 years is the deep confusion behind it, which is, say, I think we need to back up and put it in a broader perspective just for a moment, which is what's driving immigration policy, all the rules and regulations about uh, border security, who can come in, when, temporary workers, all of that is no longer informed by a clear principle. And as a result, it's very confusing. And I would affirm that congressmen themselves and their staffs don't really know how those rules and regulations work. And as long as we're not informed by a deeper principle, what is the objective of our immigration policy? What, what purpose does it serve? It's hard to have a particular policy. And as a result, the various factions in, within Congress, the various interest groups, get little pieces here and there, pulling and pushing, and you have a large, incomprehensive policy that then, over the course of those 40 years, sends us in all sorts of different directions. The problem with immigration today is not them, it's us. The immigrants are very similar. We've changed. The immigrants are uh, coming from what we would call the third world. And in fact, a century ago, they were coming from what was then the third world, Sicily, Eastern Europe, that sort of thing. And they're coming from small towns or rural areas. For the most part, they're uh, you know, pretty motivated kind of strivers, not the poorest people in those communities, but kind of one step up looking for something more. So they're very similar people. But they're coming to a very different kind of place. One quick way I uh, describe that is that a century ago, an immigrant from Sicily or Odessa came from a place where there was horse manure in the streets, and they came to New York or Boston, and there was horse manure in the streets there, too. Now they're coming to a 21st century place that isn't like that at all anymore. We've got, you know, uh, internet. We don't have flying cars yet, but it's that kind of thing. I mean, it's a huge cultural gap that uh, just wasn't as big as uh, it used to be. And it's much more difficult, both really for the immigrants and for us, to deal with people who are that different from us. This problem of 19th century workers in a modern society uh, resonates down the generations because a century ago, if you had a Sicilian, frankly, there wasn't the, that much emphasis on education among their families either. And so those kids may have dropped out early, gone to work, that sort of thing. It didn't really matter that much if you dropped out at seventh grade uh, 100 or 150 years ago. Today it does. Nowadays it doesn't work that way. And so immigration is creating potentially another underclass in a way that we really didn't see happen a century ago not because today's immigrants are less desirable, but because there's a mismatch between them and us. We have now a very extensive system of, of benefits, of rules and regulations in American society, which broadly is called the welfare state. A hundred years ago when immigrants came, that was not the case, which meant that those immigrants scrapped together, worked together, got out of, uh, of where they started, got the corner grocery store, went forward and succeeded. The concern today is that immigrants are coming here and there's a very easy way for them to become dependent. And so that system doesn't work anymore. So this, this question of who's coming here and what kind of skills they have is not only an economic question. Do they have the kind of skills that our economy needs? 
it tells us something about the individuals, the types of individuals, and whether they are the kinds of immigrants who will more likely go the path of assimilation and succeed in American society, which many of them do, or they will tend to live in enclaves and become uh, dependent upon benefits from state and local governments and the federal government. The federal government did commission a study on the deficit back in the early 90s, the Jordan Commission, and their findings was that uh, the typical immigrant household receives $13,000 a year from the federal government in benefits. Uh, they pay $10,000 in federal taxes, which leaves a deficit of $3,000 per household, per immigrant household, throughout all the uh, immigrant communities in, in, in the United States on average. But if you multiply that $3,000 times all the households in this country uh, that are headed by immigrants, you have a very large sum that is attributable uh, to uh, immigration. That is a deficit item. That study, which was done in the early 90s, is surely uh, you know, underestimating the current situation simply because there are more programs that are available to immigrants, and certainly the size of the immigrant population is far larger now than it was then. So the bottom line is we have a big deficit problem that is attributable to immigration, yet no one in Washington seems to be focusing on this particular part of the, of the deficit.